Is this me in my early days? <laughs> we didn't have colors. I'm a bit proud of that picture. I, I was uh, I was early in uh, embracing computers. Uh, in those days, it was early. Uh, I was like 14 or so. Um, so I was one of the local experts. So I was called in to do, I'm actually older, I'm 17. But I was called in to do training to local people. Um, so actually my dad was called in, but he he's like the state I am in now. Now I can't code anymore. I, so I, I will be blunt with you. I haven't been coding for 10 years. I'm a little bit embarrassed. I hope I will be able to do it again because I miss it. I enjoyed it. Uh, I, I met a good friend, <laughs> my stage producer. Actually, we turned out to be colleagues for a couple of years ago. Uh, I didn't notice. So excited about that. But anyways. So I like that's why I bring up this picture. At one time, I was able to code. I was pretty good at it. Uh, <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> you know this. I was actually able to code in the assembly also. I was pretty, pretty good. But uh, not anymore. Uh, so I have to rely on people like you to do this. Uh, but I'm, I'm proud of being able to talk to people like you. I'm particularly have to be. I'm very proud of being able to give this talk. Because this is about, in my mind, it's one of the, I feel not saying the most, but one of the most important aspects of Agile is the engineering practices. And I remember it kind of started, people, some people argue that Agile has been around actually forever, since the 50s or 60s when we started getting a computer in our hand. It was natural to develop software in an iterative manner, evol evolutionary manner. And then in the 90s, some crazy people thought we could uh, uh, describe how it should be done. Yeah, when I first re yeah when I first read the book, it made so much sense because I think it was kind of a break in the late 90s because there was this movement in the object-oriented community in the in the 80s and 70s. It was quite strong, but it was kind of internal. And then in the end of the 90s, uh, Kent Beck wrote this book, which really hit and embraced a, a much, much larger community. So in my mind, how I've experienced is that's when Agile really started. Because then we started to use the term, and more people embraced it. So it was uh, important. And to me, as like starting early, it made so much sense. Instead of uh, I was being conditioned in a traditional this American consulting company where we're conditioned to believe that we will wait for a sophisticated design to come and we will make it and then someone else will test it and it will take forever, a lot of paper and a lot of confusion, a lot of stress in the end because we always tend to miss or for some reason they didn't really want what they were described to us. That's why I like this engineering practice which puts an emphasis on stuff that works and also I put up these pictures because the, the, the value of these kind of things and, and how the, the agile community learn from each other, these are the kind of events and all the, like the community, we, we love to share our experiences, our opinions, we challenge each other. So it's a very vibrant way of, of learning, I feel. So this is from, I was the industry chair at XP 2010, which was I'm very proud of that also, but I, it's just an example of, of how powerful these events are. So I'm very happy for you that you started doing this here now. I think you had similar events, but this is, uh, this is branded Agile India, and, 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 um, and there's so many people here. But anyways, this is, uh, is this visible at all? I will go into these things when, when we go. So I, when I put this together, I try to use more common terms among IT people. So in the Agile community, we tend to use some words and we take for granted that people know those words. So I boiled it down to the, the essence is we code and we test and deliver. And those terms, they are understood outside our, our community also. Uh, traditional IT people, they will understand those words. So they're not very sophisticated, but I like the simplicity, simplest thing. Um, so I'll talk about those aspects, and uh, I'll talk a little bit about some supporting practices also, collaboration and process support. But uh, the emphasis is on the 
the actual thing. And I was pondering how to do this. And when I, I, I proposed this first time for Agile 2011, Salt Lake City, I gave me some feedback. And I kind of like, uh, so I deliberately to start with testing because that was so kind of core to, I think that's what, uh, what Kent Beck was pushing on, test driven development. But this kind of aspect is, uh, from, yeah, this is, you know, uh, yeah, well, let's do the next one, just so that you get the context. This is, this is called different things in the community. You sometimes you'll hear people calling about, uh, talking, talking about acceptance testing. Uh, Ken Beck was very strict about there's only two types of testing. There's acceptance testing and unit testing. And I kind of like that. It was kind of refreshing. I'm used to being a consultant. We had seven types of testing or eight, ten. Um, and in one way, that's kind of true. But I like this. This is kind of refreshing. There's only two kinds of testing. There's a test where you accept the system, and there's a test where you, as a developer or guy responsible for thing, you take responsibility for testing what you do. So in one sense, it makes sense, because then there are other people testing, acceptance testing that, and so it's okay. Um, so, and then I, I feel I need to just to give some perspective into this. When we talk outside our community, we will talk to people, we talk to organizations that have a test department or QA department. So I think it makes make sense to, to relate to that. Like from a dogmatic view, there are still, I mean, there's only two types of testing, acceptance testing and unit testing. And the agile community, the, uh, has put a lot of emphasis on supporting the acceptance testing part or the functional testing part. It's, it's kind of what I'm realized is that if you say functional testing, it causes less confusion. If you say acceptance testing, it's kind of very formal. They're kind of still a, a buy into that, but it's kind of, that's usually perceived as the, the organization uh, formal commitment to your deliverable. So they usually, sometimes they might even have an external agency doing that just to make it really formal. Because then they sign off and, and, and they take on the risk or responsibility. But in this sense, I, I like to say, just be simple about it. Just two forms of testing, acceptance testing or unit testing. And uh, there might be, in, when you, in real life, you have to juggle this. So I was in the IRS and, and then we had to call this, I think we called it this uh, developer's team's functional testing. And um, this was still the QA doing the formal acceptance testing. But if you really, I think the, the aim, uh, I think we should um, strive to go towards, uh, to, to achieve is we want also testing to embrace, be embraced in an agile manner. And I've seen it being used fairly successfully. We have, uh, I, last year I was working for Citrix Online and then we have the QA people they were formally embedded into the Scrum teams. And I like that. So then they have the same stake as the developers. But that, that doesn't always happen, unfortunately. So the, uh, and they were actually driving the test almost too much because they made the developers lazy. Because there is a, the developers, I think, they should still feel some kind of responsibility in the testing. Um, so there's a, you should find out how to play that. But anyways, I'm talking about the background. Uh, so the scope of the presentation, this is about the functional acceptance testing. Uh, BDD is a popular term, behavior driven development. So if there's a talk about that during this conference, I would recommend that. It's kind of, so I might go deeper into this. The way just to uh, set the expectations, I'll only give some smells or taste bites of these things. Um, but hopefully enough. So if you want to go into details, I will encourage you to go into talks or tutorials that covers these things. Uh, I'm pretty sure there is. There usually is. Uh, there's a lot of enthusiasm. I think in the testing, there's always people engaged about that. Uh, and then listen to those who are extremely passionate about it because it's, it's good. Um, so usually this is the way we do it. Um, this is the ideology, but I like it to try to work this way. Hope it's not mine. <laughs> so to be first to describe the behavior and scenarios, and that that description should ideally be executable. 
that's a behavior driven design kind of ideology. So you behave, describe it in a way that you can execute it, you know, like a script or a test type of program that you can run the program against. So then, like the book says, you run the test, and of course it, it fails the first time because you haven't made anything, but you should do that. It's kind of, I kind of deliberately do that. Test it before I have anything. So just make sure that at least that test works. It should fail even if you don't have anything. If it pass, if you don't have anything, then the test is not really good. So. Um, and then you fix things. Uh, so th this is the kind of the coding part. If you code, fix here means this is at the, at the feature level or function level. So you, you, you have your test, you run the test, it fails, you fix things, find out how to fix things, and then you actually run the test again. So this is, uh, say, first time is the first real one. Then you just do this in cycle until all tests pass. And you should, do, you should all tests should pass. If they don't pass, you're delivering something that doesn't work. So what you could do, you could adopt the test. Like if you say, uh, this thing is not really that important. But then, you, then that's a functional requirement. Then you should adopt your test to accommodate that. Instead of this thing bugs or I, I, I get red lights and then accept that. You never accept a red light. If you, the dogmatic agile view. You change the test to, so they can trust the test. You really want, and the test should be you probably know that, but the test should be full automatic. You shouldn't require any manual inspection because if they do, uh, then you lose the effectiveness. I know there are some shades of gray hair or nuances, but I, I like to take that view. Try to get that ambition. To have your executable test, run them against the thing, and they should be automatic. They should make the decision on whether the task is and the pass or not, and you know, so you can see it. Um, then there is a debate in the community, especially when agile people meet uh, the test community. Uh, it isn't always possible to fully automatically test everything. And that's actually true. But still, I like for us to aim to do as far as you can. There are some things that might be extremely challenging to test. But don't accept it up front. Try. Maybe there are ways that you can try. Because there are people who have actually I think uh, Google has made test programs that can assess some quality measure of the usability automatically. And I think that's, there are people doing amazing things. I thought you have to have a pe person to be able to do that. But they can give you some kind of things. So there's a lot of things happening. So uh, this is just an example of how we have done things. Uh, this is um, an electronic uh, scrum tool. Uh, and most of these tools provide a way of uh, describing tests. So, and we actually did this. Then, no, not throughout, but we tried to. In the beginning, even I thought that, that sounded a bit, <laughs> should we do that? We, we know the story, we know what we're supposed to do. But it kind of uh, makes it very disciplined if you have those things. And these tools, they usually provide ways of tracking uh, how the test passes. So we can get the pretty precise measure of progress. So you see, like, I prepared this for Agile 2011, so here you see, I tried to make this a proper user story format. And then they have uh, some tests that could be, because the test is your way of assessing how you can say this story is done. Um, yeah, unlike in this case, they fail the first time because I haven't done it yet. Okay, so here's a set of other tools that uh, I've heard of. When I mention tools, just be, I know there are, I remember last time, the vendors are pretty excited if they see the tools um, and maybe others who have been involved in developing them. I haven't done an extensive research. So these are just tools that I have been exposed to, that I've seen. There might be other tools out there. Um, but these are, so I, and, no vendors is paying me anything. Uh, I'm not asking them to do that. So there might be other tools. So these are, but I believe there's some, um, some traction around these tools. Cucumber is getting a lot of traction these days. I'm kind of proud of that because it's a fellow Norwegian who's pushing it. Um, it's one of those, uh, their ambition is to be a really BDD, behavior-driven development tool, where you, you describe what you do 
uh, in English. You describe the test in English, and then you actually execute that test. And there are mechanisms for doing that. I feel like showing you, actually. It's, um, I was, um, last time I did a demo, it t takes a little more, lo more longer time, and I have to fix my laptop so I don't have a Ruby environment yet. But uh, just to, I haven't coded for 10 years or so. I was able to make a cucumber test. Uh, so it's that easy. It's, uh, and it's kind of cool. Um, I don't know if you can read this. You describe what you do. There is some, you're supposed to uh, follow the proper story format, normalized story format. And if you do that, you, and you use, uh, so here's the story, and you describe a scenario also in a proper structured way. And then um, Cucumber can parse that and use that to execute. Then the way it does it is, is uh, we have the, the, um, the scenarios. The scenarios are, say, test cases for the story. And then uh, they will just translate the numbers or the parameters in the story. And you have ways. This is still it's written in Ruby, uh, but it's, Ruby is it's, I don't know Ruby, but I could. I was able to do this. So, like, you instantiate the thing you want to test. You do something with the thing you want to test. Um, and that's that's also how you do unit tests. So we we try to do this. Cucumber try, uh, wants you to do it this way, and you run it, and it fails because you haven't made the calculator. And then you make the calculator, and you start to get. Uh, you run it again, and then you see some yellow because these haven't been done yet. And then you do it, like like. The pictures, uh, if you remember, the cycle, you run it until it passes. So my point of this, I wanted to show you <coughs> Cucumber as an example of how to do this. Uh, there are other tools. RSpec, I think, was the predecessor to Cucumber. Uh, and there seems to be a lot of things going on in this field. Fitness, I was hoping to demo that, but I, how many have heard of fitness? Oh, okay. Well, I don't need a demo. <laughs> Half the room. That's good. Because uh, that was very popular. I like fitness a lot. It's uh, just for those who haven't seen it, uh, it's kind of, I think the metaphor there is example-driven tests. So you, you write something based on how you, you expect it to look like. And usually by tables. And then um, here you see what you typically do. You have a, it's totally web-based. So you just hit the test button based on that table. This table is a test. And then you will get the red on the 33. You get the red there because that's wrong. And then you can act on that. And here's the test data that is wrong, not the gold. Yeah. And this is the architecture behind fitness. Um, I kind of want to show this just to get you a feel for this is typically how you make these kind of tests. So you have uh, in the community, I think this is actually what the professional testers call it. It's the system under test. Um, and you have your test cases. And then you have this, they call it pictures. You have this glue. Like in Cucumber, uh, they have these step definitions, which is the glue from the system under test to the test framework and the, the acceptance test. So um, it's fairly straightforward. The, the challenge is typically, like the guys who's working on this, to making the fixtures thin enough. Because if you get complexity into the picture, you risk adding something that can break. So that needs to be really thin. This is just something you want to access your code to be able to test. Because it's tempting to be very sophisticated about the picture. OK, so to coding. Um, and uh, I boxed in our community, we usually talk about test-driven development. So this is uh, the, the kind of test that is close to the code. The kind of test I was describing earlier, the, the goal is to actually, actually our wish, our dream, is that we will have the stakeholders writing those tests. Um, and I think you should try for that. Try to challenge your stakeholders to write those tests. So th and then it's very important that the test framework allows you to do that, that it is not too complex. So like having 
uh, cucumber right uh, set definition is probably a good thing. Uh, we, but I have to admit, we had a really hard time making that happen. It's really challenging. So usually we end up doing it, uh, the developers. But so, but try to avoid it. But if you have to, at least what you could do is like if they give them at least the numbers and the description, and you try to be extremely accurate about getting that down, so you don't add any. Be very careful of interpretation. If you disagree, talk to them. Uh, don't change it. Have a conversation with them to make sure that you understand what this is. What it is. Okay. So about coding. Um, These are some practices that I believe are important. Refactoring, source code control, peer programming. So I'll go through some of them. You see, the loop is almost the same, and that's intentional. It's supposed to be the same. Uh, but there are some things that you think about when coding when that you don't really think about or think less of uh, in, in the acceptance testing. So you, you code your test. And that's actually, how many of you, have you are used to JUnit? Well, quite a few. Um, how about MUnit, if you use C-sharp? TestNG, uh, some there. So you seem to be fairly exposed to it, so you know, know the drill. Um, but I still want to stress this, because in, um, even in Eclipse, I think, and especially Visual Studio, uh, Visual Studio has a wizard that creates J unit or N unit. I think it creates tests based on your classes. It, it, hmm? it does? Okay. And, uh, you don't want to go that route. No, you don't want to. That's the point. Because <laughs> uh, I will challenge you try not to fall for that temptation. Write the test first and then write the classes. It just, that's the whole idea. You want to write the test first, and uh, it is not that hard. You don't need a wizard to make that. You just, because, and the only thing the wizard does is write stubs. I think you should be very careful at this, <laughs> because uh, the whole mentality, because the, the refreshing view here is that you write the test first, and if you have never done that, try it. It's actually, it's, if you've never done it, it's very challenging, because you, you probably have a design in your head you want to code, uh, but if you do the test first, you're so much more focused. You just do, you do the simplest thing. If you do the other way, you might over-design. It's fairly easy. So the difference here between the other thing is this guy, and I would like to stress that. How many of you refactor uh, on a regular basis? Oh, good. This is, this is nice. You're better than uh, the Americans. I was in Salt Lake City. I was like getting 20% of the room. <laughs> so I will continue that. For the results, I, I understand why it might be challenging. Because uh, you get pushed to deliver feature, and people tend to only create, care about features. But it's like uh, Rebecca told us this morning. It's our professional responsibility, in my mind. It's our professional responsibility to refactor mercilessly. It should be part of the cycle. Every sprint, we should refactor. Uh, I know there are, there's this concept of a refactoring sprint. I feel it's a bit unfortunate that it has come to bear. Uh, but it's better than nothing. So if you need a refactoring sprint, do that. And in my mind, if you need specific stories to refactor, to, 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 to get it prioritized, do that. There are some schools that says you shouldn't have refactor stories on the story backlog because it should be second nature. But in my mind, if it doesn't happen by not doing it, put it there. I, I, I don't think we should be religious about that. We should, I think we should be religious about refactoring. I think it's so important. Because if, if not, and I have seen it, I'm pretty sure you've seen it, the, the code does rotten. It gets, if you don't take care of it, it will get sour. And then uh, submit often. In my mind, uh, I feel we should submit as often as we can. We don't want to submit to something that breaks for others. But still, you don't want to be too, too careful. Just, you will probably submit. Have anyone not broken a build? <laughs> you have? 
<laughs> okay. I might want to hire you. But it's, it, it will happen. So I know we should be careful because you waste other people's time. But we shouldn't be, I feel, at least once a day, uh, maybe more times a day. Like pe people hold on to their stuff. You see, way too long. This is, um, yeah. I, I have some, I think I have some thoughts about refactoring or branching strategies. This is uh, just to show you, if you, you seem to be used to this, but I am, um, do the test first. <laughs> write the test code first, and then you write the classes. And it's okay to not have any classes at all. Just do that, because it actually helps you design the class also. You figure, and their view was that, uh, I think uh, Kent would sit here, uh, <laughs> typing, and Ward will sit next to him. And it, it's supposed to, it should be organized this way so they both can see, and he should be able to talk to him. And it's nice, um, and extremely intense, and it's, very, it's like a steady code review. You do it all the time. So you get this guy who's picky, and, and sometimes you get out of the, the, the dynamic can work. Um, you kind of feel sometimes you do a really trivial thing, and maybe you don't need Ward or anyone else to help you with that. And it's also extremely intensive. It can be ex ex anything ex exhaustive. It could be by sitting next to a guy. I think uh, one guidance I've been given is maybe six hours a day. Maybe you can, you can do more if you have the stamina. Uh, but give yourself maybe some time. And also, I like how they do it. Like, and I've seen this happens usually automatically. If you have a team that is well bonded, you tend to you want to discuss with another guy and test the idea and get feedback. And that's uh, so. And you probably aware that the peer program part is not only the code review; it's also a, a joint design. You do that to get, uh, and it's also a way that you don't you're less in need of documenting the design because you have been talking to it with another guy. And you get the clear idea and your head of how the design looks like. Unfortunately, they haven't been founding real supporting evidence. But the claim is that um, uh, the quality gets much higher. And, and I, what I'm thinking of, maybe the research didn't take that into account. Because it's consistent review, so the quality is higher, so it's likely to be less rework after. Uh, and also, you have the design part and you have the teaching part or the learning part. Uh, what they found, though, is kind of interesting, is that for some reason, the senior developers preferred not to <laughs> have a pair. Um, and maybe because the senior, they know the domain well. I don't know. Or they used to it. Whereas the juniors, they kind of liked it. Um, but I think there are a lot of supporting claims. but. Um, the, the scientific evidence is not extremely strong. So that's why I'm kind of thinking, maybe be practical about it. Do go to your colleague wh when you think there's value in it. You, you might not have to do it all the time. Professional. Refactoring, um, you seem to be used to that. I was kind of thinking, no, oh, that's more of source code. Uh, I haven't slide on source code, but I thought of making a comment on or do you, any of you have a good experience in branching strategies? You want to share that? And you will feel to share a strong branching strategy. Yeah, we, uh, we have one simple strategy called, uh, that we follow. Yeah. Uh, we uh, also brought our method project uh, runs for around four to five months. Yeah. And uh, after they gain a first release, the client wants to uh, do some rapid changes. Okay. And this parallel, you will keep on giving a small minor tweak here and a minor tweak there. Okay. So it becomes challenging. What we uh, typically do is create first the main trunk, yeah. which is after our first release, it uh, becomes like, you know, this is our main stuff. And uh, whenever uh, we, we maintain one minor release, and yeah. the other is a uh, uh, minor trunk, and other is a change request trunk. Okay. So the change request trunk would come to the main trunk after the end, at the end of first, uh, the, oh, yeah, first one month, like, you know, after six oh, okay. months, the first one month. Uh -huh. The minor releases is like you just switch over to the branch, brand new branch, new branch, 
the work completed, bring it back into the okay. So that merging happens uh, you know, faster. Okay. Whereas the other one comes, keeps on coming after a month and month. So oh. That's how we manage it out. Okay, how does the the one that comes monthly, how does that go? Uh, it's a merging which happens with file comparisons happen. Yeah. And if there's a new file, it's copied as it is. And yeah. in PHP, not in Java. Okay. No, no, but it's you probably... Just compare the files uh, mm. using a file comparing tool. If it's yeah. an existing file, then move the code back in. Okay. Yeah. Because um, I, I have to admit, I like the other, like the first one, like when you go often, because that's the ideal. Yeah, you go often, very small thing, you yeah. go often, but there's a larger change. I know. If you just put that in, the entire stuff will break down. Yeah, I know. You can't put that in, so yeah. it has to go at the end of it. Yeah. After, like, you know, you have schedule a monthly release, so yeah. at the end of the month, you are actually bringing it to the main branch. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's a, it's probably it's a typical trade offs. Still, I like uh, there are people as and maybe I, we also did that, okay. <laughs> so it's a typical practice. But I think what we're trying to push is that uh, you want the trunk to be you want the trunk trunk to be safe, but you also want your work to be current. So these guys who are branching off, they will have one month where not they're not uh, they're not current with the trunk, yeah. uh, which could be an issue because maybe there are things in the trunk that you would like. So. What I saw, I think it's Henrik Nyberg, he, he wrote, there's a paper on it. Like, and I like that recommendation, that to have all, you probably have branches, but what you could do, you can, you can, you, you can be respectful to the trunk, but then you can merge, you can sync with the trunk as often as you can, ideally daily. So they're like, they could, if they could sync with the trunk on a daily basis, then you don't mess up the trunk, uh, and you're also current. But what you also should do, you need things back to the trunk. That should also happen often. So you do that when you're done testing. And ideally, you test, you have continuous integration and things work, and then you can just push it back. But, but I do know if you're concerned with that. But ideally, if you believe in continuous integration, you should be able to push it back to the trunk uh, after each successful CI. Um, if you don't trust the trunk, crazy things happen. So uh, I really. At least we should be respectful of that. You should trust the trunk. If you don't trust the trunk, people will, in the worst case, they won't use it anymore. So you rail off and you have your own thing. So you have to trust the trunk. And that's why I like CI. Ideally, CI should be the way, so you should get things. I heard people at work, they call it, oh, the, the trunk is successful. I don't want to be anywhere near it. I don't want to have anything from it because people throw everything at it. <laughs> yeah. Well, it turned out, I think it was, I, it was a bad day for him. <laughs> it wasn't that bad, but if people have that perception that the trunk is successful, <laughs> it wasn't that bad. But it was, uh, I think someone made a mess that day which affected him. And uh, it wasn't really that bad. But <laughs> so anyways, here are a couple of tools. Um, some interesting thing. Is um, uh, you know people tend to be passionate about their IDEs, and that's okay. I think I think I will be inclined to let people have their own IDEs, but it depends. And maybe people have a super productive setup of an IDE, so maybe you want to have a standard of it. But people have emotional feelings about it, and I kind of that might be maybe we should respect it. I don't know. Um, but then again. They are, in my mind, as a CTO of a company that has been coding for 10 years, they seem fairly similar. They usually pick up from what they do. So Eclipse is, in my mind, pretty good. I know IntelliJ is probably better because we actually pay for it. Um, and I know the passion seems to be stronger on the IntelliJ idea than it on Eclipse. So I, I, I can understand it. Uh, test framework, we talk about that. Mocking. This is uh, kind of interesting when I was looking into what was happening. And every time I looked, something new is coming up. So when I looked, there was Mokita was the cool thing. Uh, I'm not sure what's the cool thing now. What's the coolest thing? Hmm? What? I, I like Mokito. Mokito. So Mokito is a cool thing. But mocking tools are good. I, I didn't talk about that, but I, you're probably used to that. So I use mocking tools. And the good thing about several mocking tools, you can use the one that suits you the best. And I say, you really don't have to standardize on mocking, because that's what you want to standardize is on the actual deliverable. 
uh, and it's okay to have multiple mocking tools. They have different they have different sort of purposes. Version control is kind of interesting. There is a debate that's been going on for a while that uh, distributed version control is. People tend to be again more passionate and they love distributed version control tool than centralized version control tool. It's a very interesting debate, and I think it's a healthy debate. Uh, but people should you don't need to be religious about it. Figure out what works with your organization. There's kind of there's a lot of there's more traction around Git, Mercurial, and those kind of tools than the other tools. So there might be because of that traction, people will move over. I don't know. But I do want to say this thing. I hope there's no vendors here. Usually, the extremely expensive source control tool tends to be very complex. Um, they might be extremely good. <laughs> then about something really cool. All the coding testing is also cool. But uh, I think there is so much thing happening in this field in delivery, how we make our stuff operational. The whole the DevOps thing, I have a tremendous faith in that. It's challenging. We, we tr yeah, we tried. Some, sometimes we can make it do, happen. Sometimes it's almost impossible. Uh, so I think some of these practices is very supportive of that. And I call it delivery through continuous integration. Continuous integration is a popular term. It's a term I think Kent Beck used in his book. So we sort of take it for granted that people know what that means. Uh, I, I kind of feel that it's a little bit imprecise because it has to do with more, it's not only integration, it has to, I think it has started to mean delivery or build, continuous build. So people are doing continuous build, they say, just to be clear. I think originally it was, because uh, these guys, they came from the small talk world. Uh, so it was about, you do some things and you just test everything. As and I think in, in the beginning, it wasn't me even automatic. But then I think it was ThoughtWorks who made cruise control and the, the concept of doing this automatically on the server uh, really caught on. And then now, so the concept uh, in my mind, it has to rely on an integration server running in the background. It's asynchronous, it runs. You don't fire it off, it just smells when it needs to run. Um, and they call it, I think it's sort of an official name, CI server. <laughs> Uh, you usually have one if you're, you adopted this practice. And uh, usually it does it this way. Uh, it compiles or builds, uh, depends on the environment how it does it, but it does some things to, to pack it together. Uh, and usually I would strongly recommend that you, you do, there's so many automatic analysis tools, so you fire off some of them. Um, you do your tests, and usually, so you have the CI server who, who builds the state thing, and then you deploy it to a test environment, which usually is another environment, uh, have the test run, and then you, you compile the analysis and the test reports and make them, uh, them visible. Earlier, Maven did all of this. I think Maven, they are more, uh, they do, only the compile and build. And I think that maybe that makes sense and other tools have done the other things. I'll, I'll, I'll give you a picture of the tools landscape after. And feel free to pitch in because there might have been something happening over the last years. You make the visible, I think that's extremely important. Uh, in uh, my last organization we failed to do that. So, and people somehow were reluctant to show these things. And I feel this is very important. I have seen it successfully done where uh, when they started to expose the results, they cared more about improving the quality. If you don't see it, then, uh, then even the scrum master or the project manager started to care. And I kind of, if you get that support, it's, it could be even stronger because it, maybe you just have to admit sometimes we might not care enough or someone needs to tell us that we think quality is important. And if you see it in your face, it helps. And then you deploy it. And then, uh, but this is actually just part of it. And then you, uh, so but this is the core part. You message them. So it's kind of coming, it was fashion for a while. I don't know how people do today, but I, like the CI tools, they usually send a mail if the build breaks. But now you have all kinds of cool things. You have Venice that can jump up. You have lava lamps, or you have, I will show you, it's for people. 
be used uh, big TVs uh, with the face of the guy who last committed. <laughs> but it was kind of, but it was, it was healthy. It wasn't too bad. So I feel strongly about using the source code also for the final thing. Uh, this is about how the process from you develop, you check in, it's in a source repository and you pull it. That's in the normal way, so it, it check the, the, the build server or the CI server checks in if, if it's anything new. So it's kind of important to realize that. So it doesn't have to be the last guy checking in who makes the mess, but oftentimes it is. Because it just takes, usually pulls and takes or something. So here are some tools. Uh, um, I mentioned Maven, and maybe you've heard of Sawtype, uh, which is, it's a um, uh, proxy <laughs> to the internet, so to speak. Because sometimes Maven downloads all of the internet, and in, in, uh, if you are a big team, you don't, don't want to do that. So we found Nexus uh, Sonotype to be very useful. Uh, Hudson were named, were mentioned. You have uh, Jenkins. Well, Jenkins was named. Yeah, I didn't know Yeah. So Jen Jenkins is, is more vibrant. Yes, more vibrant. Okay. Okay. Interesting. Uh, kind of that seemed to be happening, <laughs> but it's very cool. I don't know, people are passionate about Jenkins. They used to be passionate about Hudson. So it's obviously something good. Uh, and then there's the commercial tools doing similar things. I think uh, Bamboo is also quite popular. Yeah. Have you heard it? If I could throw one yeah. back. I mean, again, I don't get paid for this. <laughs> okay. Um, um, Team City okay. is excellent. I mean, in terms of visibility, big visible things you get everywhere. Yeah. Easy to do stuff if you spend your time doing coding rather than writing a build server. Okay. Uh, and if, even if you have to buy it, it's not that expensive. Yeah. Okay. Is that uh, language agnostic or is it tied uh, to any environments? No, no, no. It's by um, uh, JetBrains. JetBrains. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Same people. Same with, uh, oh, yeah. Same like three sharper yeah. guys? Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, cool. They make good stuff. I, I'm not paid to say that too. Yeah, they make good stuff. Here, kind of like Sonar because um, they, they pull. Uh, they, they pull the analysis reports together, and I think they drive them also. Uh, in the early days, we had uh, some Norwegian. We made X Radar, uh, which is similar to what Sonar is now. Uh, but I, maybe because Sonar got more attention, or I think the X Radar guy <laughs> got promoted to some management position, so he wasn't able to support it anymore. But the, the same idea that you you capture uh, multiple uh, measurements from multiple tools uh, and. Uh, the most powerful aspect is actually measuring trends that you see improvements uh, through each time. Fine, well, then you have all of these tactical tool fine bugs, which I was the first time I heard of it. I was just fantastic. Are people making? Um, you probably know about that. There's some new things coming up. I came across this. I'm not sure if that's an old one or a new one, but this is CKJM. Is they provide a series of metrics. Um, I think they have a metrics themselves. But you can find them if you Google them, uh, uh, JDepend. And then there's uh, Google Testability Explorer. And I think, uh, I don't remember exactly what this code analysis plugin is. But the cool thing is essentially cyclomatic complexity uh, tools, measure cyclomatic complexity, which measure the sort of the essential complexity in the code, how many branches you have. and, and and it's kind of, um, I think it's, the number tells you something. <laughs> if you have a high number, you should probably look into it. So, so those are the delivery tools. Um, getting any, because uh, I'm pretty sure there's some more things that happen. Any other tools you've come across? Yes? Yeah, Gradle. Is it good Gradle? Gradle. Yeah. How is it written? G R A. G R A. Gradle, yes. and that's for? It's, it's a GUI based tool, but it works on Java code as well. Okay. Uh, the best part of 
Yeah. Okay. Okay. So it's a build tool. Yeah, it's a build tool. Yeah. And then you mentioned something else earlier. Um, what was that again? I forgot. No, yeah, you I mentioned it, Howard. Uh, Team City, which is also a build. Any other tools you have seen or like or? Like Sona, I've used Panoptical. What, Benoptical? Panoptical, C A N O T, but it's C-O-D-E. C-O-D-E, yes. Panoptical, OK, cool. It just does take place. May have Sona if you haven't seen it. I, I like those kind of tools. And I like the fact that it, that it has happened on people. People get motivated by this. They see it makes sense to focus on quality. Sometimes I have this team who uh, they had a hard time committing themselves to improving the test coverage because they didn't really see the use of it. And then we started using X radar, which is similar to sonar. Then they saw the need for it. They saw the use of it. So, so I think only that has a great uh, sense of um, use. Okay, a little bit on process side. Uh, this is, uh, when I proposed this as a tool thing originally, so I thought I could touch, if you're not that interested, we can skip quickly, but it's kind of interesting, there's stuff happening here also. So I thought, uh, if you want to have a process tool, what kind of process tools do you want? This is, so that essentially you would like to have support for three types of processes, uh, Kanban, Scrum, or issues. So you, if you, and if you have a strong preference for Scrum, for instance, you would look for tools that are good with Scrum. Like version one, this, it's very good with Scrum. Uh, it doesn't support Kanban that well. Uh, you can tweak it in. Well, we, we managed to tweak it in. But it's kind of like, in Kanban, you, you have uh, a workflow with, uh, you have a specific workflow. But for some reason, in version one, that workflow end up being a global one. I, I, there's some, it's kind of, it's, you have to squeeze it in with the shoehorn. So it's possible, but it's uh, obviously not designed for it. <laughs> you recognize that? <laughs> okay. Uh, and the whiteboard, uh, it's a great tool. So this is a sample of tool. And uh, there's a lot of people get a bit heated that we don't like these electronic tools because we like the whiteboard. And of course, I like the li whiteboard. Whiteboard is by far the most efficient communicative tool. Uh, we think it's challenging if you are distributed, if you have people working on the same team, uh, same, same project across distances, <coughs> whiteboard is challenging. So th that's a good reason, in my mind, to have an electronic tool. So um, I was in a shop where we used version 1, so I know version 1. I'm not a big fan of it. I don't want it. Uh, it's, a, it's a good tool, uh, but I, the whiteboard is better and I... Before version one, I used Jira, so maybe that's why I kind of maybe that's why I like Jira. But it's like uh, it's almost it's more emotional than anything else. I think <laughs> you get attached to something because you're used to it. Uh, I think I, I like the vendors behind; they really want to make something good. So you, and they usually respond to if you complain about something that they don't support, they usually respond to it. And it's uh, when you get used to version one, it's actually pretty good. So this is uh, we use this for a stand-up, so you have your, you have your backlog, uh, and you can see it on a storyboard level where you only see the stories, or you have the task board level where you see the task by stories. So it's, for, when you get to use it, it was fairly effective. And you have a burnout chart, and you see, and you see when things are not healthy, for instance. We have been spending almost two weeks on the same things, not progressing. It's nice to see that. We should have probably seen it earlier. So those tools, they, they provide that instantly. In, in, uh, you might not see it that easily in a whiteboard. So there are some advantages that you can see some unhealthy trends. Just hope you're aware of that. You should never spend uh, eight days on 40 points. That's not very healthy. But sometimes we did that. <laughs> This is kind of cool. Uh, one of the other things you can get, although this is a, 
uh, release forecasting. Uh, and we started doing this because um, before we started using it was just a theory. You use the numbers, the data to extrapolate when you're done. Uh, and uh, we were pretty good at, actually we, we did a, um, we, we, we did a bulk estimation of the whole backlog. Uh, and through that, and when we got an established velocity, a version one can project um, release forecast. And that's very powerful. We use that to coordinate between dependent teams. And also to get feedback or for yourself, because usually, at least what I'm used to, there is an expectation on a date. Uh, and by using that tool, you can, uh, you can take action on that expectation. So if you see you're very far off that date, you need to take action. And you need to take action as soon as you get that information. As opposed to in the old days, you took action a couple of weeks before because you wouldn't dare to. Now you take action when you see it happen, and you can start a conversation to deal with it. Either negotiate about the date or negotiate about the scope. And those conversations should happen. So I kind of like that. Jira, this is actually the tool that I was used to. Now I have forgotten how to use it effectively, but I really like Jira. It's a user-friendly, it's actually an easy tracking tool, uh, but the way it is set up is they have uh, templates to support Agile, and it's, so it's fairly supportive of Scrum, and I don't know about the Kanban, I haven't tried it. Anyone tried Jira on Kanban? Yeah. Okay. The beauty of Jira, I also tried Mantis, but it's a source of bug tracking tool. And uh, I prefer Mantis over Jira. Okay. The reason why is that, you know, in Jira, um, it provides you too much of flexibility in terms of configuring. You can actually configure. Uh -huh. Suppose if you are going to, if I got client X, client Y, client C. Okay. So configure a workflow very special to client X, client Y, and you know, even deal with every damn thing. Okay. They will not continue the like in the same tool in fact. Mm -hmm. It's absolutely uh, flexible. But in Mantis you are like, you know, um, the, the controls are limited the way you want to do it, things are limited. Oh. Um the uh, what does bug tracking tool need to yeah. for you and we that's your plan and some basic stuff that you know the other system on the market has got that. Okay. That's a simple so our speed of deploying and doing mm -hmm. things in Mantis is far ah, yeah. ahead. Interesting. Uh, I don't uh, very complex stuff, so, good. You know? uh, valid feedback. Good, thank you. So, um, so and then I'm uh, just fair to say because we're sponsored by Rally here. Rally is also very dedicated to supporting those kind of things. Actually, I used Mantis uh, in the days, but I don't remember exactly how it was. <laughs> yeah. Okay, good. So I think these are the ones that are maybe most known. There are more, I know. Um, and there might be some more down in the stalls. So we'd be respectful. I like that there is uh, that are vendors who care about this. Uh, next part, that's my final thing. I hope I'm good on time. Yeah. Are, okay. yeah. For, um, Not really, maybe you guys are. Uh, try to remember. No, yeah, yeah, there are, there are. <laughs> there are plenty. Uh, there's something called Scrum. There are some web-based tool that are pretty cool. Uh, shoot, what's it called? <laughs> Sorry? Ice Scrum? Okay, I haven't heard of that, that's probably. I think there are plenty of web-based, and they're only web-based. And there uh, was a pretty cool tool which was very supportive of Kanban. Uh, I don't remember exactly what it was. <laughs> Sorry. I'll see if I recollect. I'll, I'll let you know. Uh, I want to find, uh, talk about collaboration uh, because I believe that is important to be effective, especially in our setting now. We, we work across the world. Uh, it's unavoidable. Uh, you don't always, I, I like this picture because this is, uh, I like the collaboration, nature, collaborative nature of that picture. But you cannot always do it like that. But uh, it's our boss, he's sitting what there. What are you doing there? We're doing bulk estimation. 
we have 30 people estimating a full backlog. And it was just amazing. Uh, I, I thought, are you crazy? 30 people doing bulk estimation at the same time? And uh, we did it. It was uh, a bit stressful. Um, you see, some people, they prefer playing with the phone. <laughs> um, but there were quite a few who were engaged in this, so it worked. But that's not really the point, though. Uh, when it comes to collaboration, you have to support asynchronous and synchronous. Uh, the, I think uh, the Agile guys, we tend to prefer synchronous communication. I actually had, uh, I don't know if my friend is here, I had a session just before lunch where we were talking about email. Why don't you talk about email when you talk about collaboration? And email is there, we can use email. But there are some issues or challenges around the email, so I thought of just mentioning that. There are, uh, email is always there, has always been there. But I have noticed, and you have probably always also noticed, that when uh, an email goes in circle, it tends to lose its effectiveness. And sometimes people react to other things that you want them to react to. So when you see that happen, pick up the phone, talk. Don't uh, wait for these angry emails. Um, and uh, on those tools, there are, I, I like Wiki. I know I'm kind of, I feel like Wiki has settled as the, the, say, the intranet type of tool for developers. There are other attempts, but Wiki is just so natural for us. So we have, uh, and now we have tools like Confluence. You have the original Wiki. Uh, it's still there. I think you can, the cto.com. It is, I was, uh, I, I met Ward Cunningham in 2001, my first time. And then he just introduced, let's uh, work together. We should work online. We're in the same room, work online. Why should we do that? I was, I was just blown away. It was just so effective. <laughs> because I wasn't imagining, because I thought, oh, then we have to learn this tool. And he didn't provide any training. We just sat there. <laughs> it was super effective. And uh, I, I love that nature of, of, of uh, Wiki. And you actually are allowed to work with concepts that are not defined. So it's very supportive of Agile. So I, I like the concept of Wiki. And you have uh, Wikimedia. The, you probably know that. Uh, uh, the framework behind Wikipedia. So that's also there, available, we can use it. And at the time when I made this presentation, I was working with Citrix Online, so I <laughs> thought it was appropriate. But it still is, uh, I still, I'm not trying to endorse it too much, but I, I've been exposed to those tools, I know them. And there are other tools. Uh, the thing is, you would like to have a tool like GoToMeeting or Skype, where you can, uh, I think uh, the kind of tools you would like to have is a way to share the screen or to demo the thing you're doing. And you may also want to have what we found to be very effective, a way to log into another computer to do a demo on that. Because maybe you have a lab and you don't want to drag all the people to that lab, but you just log on to that computer and show what you have. And go to my PC allows you to do that. There are lots of other tools. There are, yeah, with. <laughs> we used to use TeamViewer to do remote planning. Okay, wow, cool. Yeah. TV viewer? TV viewer is very effective. Okay. Okay. Cool. And of course, Skype. Skype is. Uh, Skype combination. Okay. Nice. Okay, cool. You can also add what? Adobe Connect. Adobe Connect? Okay. Cool, very nice. Sorry? Webex? Yeah, I'll mention that. They're a competitor to Citrix, but that's okay. They're widespread on, uh, sorry? Microsoft Link as well. Microsoft? L-Y-N-C. L-Y-N-C. Okay, so that works together with Webex? Sorry? So is that a part of? Ah, okay. Okay, cool. Okay. Join.me. Yeah. Wow, good. Okay. Um, this actually, we're, uh, this wraps up my presentations.